I know some some of you have have uh, some of you have registered for the stock trading competition, and I'll put the link in the chat here. Um, are you talking about Minji? Are you talking about the uh the stock trading link? Uh, I think the link link the same address. So I think yeah, stock trading link. Okay, so it wasn't it you weren't able to get into the stock trading competition? No, but I just got the email from you, so now I can. Okay, excellent. Yeah, this is totally optional. I just wanted to create one so everyone could um make a practice portfolio. So as uh as I see here, Kritika is second, uh, Nishtha is third, Ansh Kumar's fourth. I'm uh so I'm Malajon MJ right here. So uh yeah, so I made a portfolio also and I invested in Amazon, BMO, CP, Microsoft, and Tesla here. And uh yeah, just uh I'd recommend um yeah make a portfolio on here just to test your uh just to practice your stock trading. And I made this video on investing uh, that I'll, I made a few videos on investing that I'll post. So you can watch them when you have time. Uh, so I'll put one, I'll put a few of them in the chat. So, and then I'll post them. So I'll post them under content. So part two, so investing, and you can use this for, so like investing tutorial, investing tutorial for how the market works for the stock trading competition. So uh, it's going to be there just, just so you can watch it, just to learn more about stocks and how to invest. And then, yeah, so that's one of the videos. And then there's a few others I made. I'm going to post the other ones. So there, there's one more that I'll post. And I'll put it in the chat here. A lot of it is overlap, but yeah, it's still, it's still good information. So I'll post both. And uh, yeah, I'd recommend watching them. Like even if you watch a bit of it, you don't have to watch the whole thing, but it's very valuable. Yeah. So yeah, now both both of them are visible under part part two. And yeah, so I wanted to go through that and. Uh, want to see if anyone else registered here uh so yes yeah, so we have uh uh five so far that's great so critique um thank you for doing that nishtha thank you for doing that too minji thank you for doing that Ansh kumar thank you for registering also so i'll show you my portfolio here so open positions i own these five companies right now so let's say I want to sell here. Um, so I'll start with buying. So I have, like, I can buy some more stock. So you go to make a trade here to buy a stock. And then let's say I want to buy uh, BMO here, this one. And I only have um, a bit left. I only have a few hundred dollars left here. So maybe I'll buy three shares. Maybe like, maybe two, like maybe four, let's say. Maybe four shares. And then you got to set a limit price here. So the last price right now is 92. So maybe I'll set my limit price of 92.5. Um, so I might do that. So you have to set a buy here then your symbol bmo let's say then four shares and then a limit price of above this price 
So you got to set it above. So it's 92.03 currently. So I'll set it just above at 92.50. So that's that's how I set it. And then I'll, uh, I'll take a snapshot of this for you. And uh, you can invest in many different companies. Just search the stock symbol because you have to enter the stock symbol to trade the stock. Yeah. So then you go down here, click to preview order, click to confirm order, order placed successfully. So I did that and then I go back to my portfolio and here's the trades here. And let's say I want to sell a stock to sell, let's say I want to sell BMO. So I would go to trade here and then sell, you put sell, quantity 204, type limit. And they want to place the limit order less than this. So maybe 91. Yeah, so it has to be less than that to set the limit order. So maybe 91 right here. So we'll put this in the chat here. 91. And then click to preview order. Click to confirm order. Order placed successfully. So it went through. Now I have uh, about 21,000 to trade. So I want to put that into an ETF. So exchange traded funds are very good investments for safety. So a very good ETF. There's a lot of good ETFs. ETFs are safer than stocks and provide instant diversification through uh, through the company buying many different stocks already and you don't have to do uh, much work. So um, uh, so I want to buy an ETF, um, BMO, TD, RBC, Manulife, uh, Scotiabank, and Sun Life provide the most safe ETFs. So um so search for ETFs from those companies. So um I'll ask the class, um can you find an ETF from one of those companies through Google search? So which one on this list would you think would be best like out of all of these ones here? I'll put this in the chat. So I'll ask, so I'll put this in the chat and you can open this up on your computer. Which uh, ETF would be best in your view uh, on this link?
So I found one, but uh, let me know if you see any that are good. So I'd pick this one because you, it's uh this one's good because it uh it's focused on international markets. So uh let's go with this very high growth international markets. So I'll put this in here. So this one's good. Um and then I may put in maybe 400 shares here. And then a limit price, it's at 52 here. So I'd have to put a limit price of about 53, just a bit above. So let's put that in. Click. Yeah, so it's in here. So now uh, let's see if it went through. So it hasn't went through yet, but it will in a bit. So I'll post this link in uh, the class under part two, just uh, so you... So there are potential ETFs you could uh, put into your stock trading portfolio for how the market works. So I'll put this in, ETFs. So it'll be called ETFs, ETFs for potential buying for the stock trading competition. So that's, uh, that's what I would put in here. The U.S. banks are... Um, risky uh, for the most part um but jp morgan is very jp morgan is um very stable so jp morgan is a stable bank for etfs in the us yeah so um wanted to go through that everyone and uh anyone who hasn't registered for the stock portfolio yet i'll post the link again and uh i'll track your progress so yeah buy and sell stock just to make more money in your account and uh, this is good practice for when you want to uh make your own uh make your own real money account this is good practice before you do a real money account that's why I want to go through this exercise because uh, I don't want you to lose money when you uh, invest on your own. So, Professor, um, so this is just for, I'm sorry, sorry. Oh, go ahead. So go there ahead. is this for practice? Sorry? Like it's not the real website, right? Oh yeah, it's it's uh it's not real. You're not, it's, it's just a practice uh, account. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, I used, so the ETF that I, that I used for the, um, for the account was this. Yeah, that one. So it's, it's right there. That's the ETF I used. Um, that one's a good one, but you could. You could pick any of the ones here, anyone you think is good. ETFs, so ETFs are a lot safer than stocks. So you could just buy ETFs in your portfolio uh, stock. So like your portfolio, so you could just buy ETFs instead of stocks if you want to be safer. And ETFs make a lot of return too. So that's, uh, that's, so I wanted to show you that because you could just have a portfolio with ETFs. And when you're in the um, stock contest, you can see the rankings here. And then you can see each other's portfolios. So you can figure out how, what someone's investing in. So you could check mine here and check the ones I'm in. And then you could even buy the same stocks also if you wish. 
Uh, so you could just buy AMZN, Amazon, CP Rail, Microsoft MSFT, or Tesla TSLA. So it's up to you. You could you could even copy my portfolio. That's fine. Um, it's totally up to you. But yeah, you can see uh, how the other class the other classmates are doing in terms of what they're picking. But yeah, just um, make an account and then track and then we'll uh, track progress throughout the semester. So um yeah so that's so i wanted to go through uh here and then also i uh, the um i wanted to go through a bit of indeed before we get into some of the material for today um so if you're going to look up let's say economics in indeed here or any sort of i'll ask um actually what i'll do is i'll ask the class what types of jobs are you looking for? Accounting assistance, okay, cool, so, sounds good. So accounting, let's put accounting in there. Uh, so you can put accounting in here and then you can put your email address here to receive a job alert. So, um, okay, so um, you can receive a job alert, put your email in this uh, box here and then it activates a job alert and sends you job alerts. And then I'll you know, post this in the chat here. There's a lot of accounting jobs here in Toronto. And then also there's a lot of remote um, accounting jobs. So either hybrid remote, if you wanna look for that. Put this in the chat too. So hybrid remote, also fully remote. So there's a lot of fully remote jobs. So you go to here, remote, a lot of fully remote jobs. And then if you wanna expand your horizons where it's just everywhere, so let's say just Canada altogether, find jobs. There's a lot more remote jobs all across Canada for accounting. So there are a lot of remote here. And then here, go back to Toronto. Um, then you go to job type if you want part-time right now let's say part-time look up part-time and uh location toronto yeah so there's a lot of options here so um since you're entry level uh just keep applying um and yeah keep applying and eventually you'll get a role um, and let, and feel free to send me your resume. So here, so I'll send you this, these templates for resumes and, uh, I'll put, I'll post them under, under, so I'll post them also under the part two here. So, so I'll post this under part two, just make a resume and then I can, I can look it over. You send me it, at, just put all your information into this template here and that into these templates here, and then I'll, I'll edit your resume, just send it over to me. Um, but yeah, send me your resume and then I'll, I'll look it over and give you feedback. Um, but yeah, that's, uh. And also uh, there, I'll post the link to this to Indeed also here. So I'll post this link in, in uh, part two.
So that's posted now. And then, and then also LinkedIn, there's a lot of jobs on LinkedIn. I'd recommend making an account on LinkedIn. So for accounting, you look up accounting here. And there's a lot of jobs here and then you can filter it out. You go to all, all filters here. And uh, let's say you want entry level. You go to entry level here. Uh, then maybe you want part-time here, let's say. Maybe you want remote. And uh, maybe Toronto. Yeah, so maybe you want all those options here. So then there's a lot here. There's a lot of options you find here. And maybe you just want remote. Maybe you just don't want Toronto. Maybe you just want remote. So maybe it's just remote. Maybe just Canada wide. There's a, there's a lot more opportunities when you do that. So I'll post this also in in the Conestoga. Uh, sorry, uh, Seneca. Um, in the Seneca. Uh, in the Seneca part two here. So, so LinkedIn jobs. That's how you can use LinkedIn to get jobs. And then I want to show you this video that I, I made uh, recently about getting jobs. So I'll show this here. We'll just get that up here. So... What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna I'm gonna play the video, but I'm gonna just live uh live annotate it. So I'll mute it and then just live give commentary. Relate the aggregate demand curve to the aggregate expenditures model. So change in the price level alters the location of the aggregate expenditure schedule through the real balances, interest rate, and foreign trade effects. We can directly connect the downward sloping AD curve to the aggregate expenditures model by relating various possible price levels to corresponding equilibrium GDPs. The aggregate demand curve can be derived from the aggregate expenditures model by allowing the price level to change and observing the effect of, on the aggregate expenditures schedule and thus on the equilibrium GDP. So here, uh, if, so showing this, uh, if prices go up, uh, real GDP goes down in this uh, aggregate expenditures model. Yeah. So prices go up, real GDP goes down in this aggregate expenditures model. So that's the general thing about it. We won't go through it that much in this course, aggregate expenditures, but that's the main uh, main takeaway from the aggregate expenditures model. If prices go up, real GDP goes down in this aggregate expenditures model. So that's, that's the main point of that. And then summary, increases in the economy's price level will successively shift its aggregate expenditure schedule downward and will reduce real GDP. So that's the main takeaway of this here. So the resulting price level real GDP combination will yield various points such as one, two, and three in figure A12, one, B. Together such points locate the downward sloping aggregate demand curve for the economy. Yeah. So the determinants of aggregate demand are the components of the aggregate expenditures model discussed in chapter 11. When one of these determinants changes, the aggregate expenditure schedule shifts upward or downward. We can easily link such shifts in the aggregate expenditure schedule to the shifts of the AD curve. So with the price level held constant, increases in consumption, investment, government, and net export expenditures, shift the aggregate expenditure schedule upward and the aggregate demand curves to the right. 
decreases in these spending components produce the opposite effects. So here, if there's a change in some determinant of consumption, investment, or net exports, this uh, um, yeah, so that would increase real output. So basically, if consumption, investment, and slash or net exports go up, real GDP will go up. Yeah, so if, if consumption, investment, or real exports go up, net exports go up, real GDP will go up. That's roughly what this uh, says here. Yeah. So also uh, the AD curve will shift right. The AD, the aggregate demands, AD curve will shift right when consumption, investment, or net exports goes up. So the initial increase in investment in the top graph has shifted the AD curve in the lower graph by a horizontal distance equal to the change in investment times the multiplier. This particular change in real GDP is still associated with the constant price level of P1. So the shift in the AS curve equals initial change in spending times multiplier. So um, if the government, so based on that, um, if the government spends money, uh, let's say the government spends money on infrastructure, uh, the economy will grow by the amount spent on infrastructure times the multiplier. So multiplier uh, is the, uh, it's the return, it's one plus return on investment. So if uh, the multiplier for infrastructure is 1.5, then the return is 0.5, and that's 50%. So like if they spend 1 billion on infrastructure and the multiplier is 1.5, it would be 1 billion times 1.5 equals 1.45 billion in uh, uh, economy growth, economic growth. So that's how that would work here. We got through that here. Uh, so that was just, so we got through that. So, So now let's get to fiscal policy. So that's gonna be our next task here. So we're gonna go through uh, the purposes, tools, and limitations of fiscal policy and how built-in stabilizers moderate the business cycles. Describe how the cyclically adjusted budget reveals the status of Canadian fiscal policy. Summarize recent Canadian fiscal policy. Discuss the problems that governments may encounter in enacting and applying fiscal policy. And discussing the size, composition, and consequence of the Canadian public debt. So in since 1945, fiscal policy has been one of the government's main stabilization policy tools. Active changes in government spending or taxes are at the option of the government. Non-discretionary if independent of parliamentary action. So... If the price level is downwardly inflexible at P1, 
A decrease in aggregate demand from 81 to 82 will reduce real GDP from 510 billion to 490 billion. So here, uh, what happens here is this, uh, this reduces uh, economic growth here. This reduces economic growth if uh, 80 curve shifts left. And uh, the government can uh, increase government spending, increase spending and reduce taxes to shift 80 curve rights and grow the economy. So that's uh, that's what they can do here. And then a $5 billion increase in government spending or a $6.67 billion decrease in personal taxes, producing a $5 billion initial increase in consumption will shift aggregate demand rightward from 82 to the downward sloping dash curve. If MPC equals 0 0.75, the economy would have a multiplier of four. So the initial $5 billion rightward shift provided by the government would be magnified into a total Right, would shift to twenty billion dollars, so four times five billion, returning aggregate demand back to eighty-one and real GDP back to five hundred ten billion. So you would do uh, the amount spent times multiplier to get the economic growth. So in this case, five billion times four equals economic growth of twenty billion. So that's what you would do to show uh, how how the growth would happen here. Put this in the chat. So contractionary fiscal policy, it's used to combat demand pull inflation. So um, they do this through decreased government spending, increased taxes, and combined government spending decreases and tax increases. So they do this when there when there is a very high inflation, uh, like last year, like in 2022. They do this to uh, reduce inflation. So uh, they reduce government spending, increase taxes to reduce inflation. So yeah, that's what they do in, um, so that's usually what they do. So contractionary fiscal policy. So contractionary fiscal policy uses decreases in government spending, increases in taxes or both to reduce demand pull inflation. So here an increase in aggregate demand from 83 to 84 has driven the economy to point B and ratcheted the price level up to P2 where it becomes inflexible downwards. So um so the government the government increases taxes and slash or reduces spending to reduce inflation. Inflate high inflation makes life unaffordable for people. So the government wants to reduce inflation. So um, if the economy's MPC is 0 0.75 and the multiplier therefore is four, the government can either reduce its spending by $3 billion or increase its taxes by $4 billion, which will decrease consumption by $3 billion to eliminate the inflationary GDP gap of 12 billion, 522 billion minus 510 billion. Aggregate demand will shift leftward first from 84 to the dash down sloping curve to its left and then to 85. 
And then with the price level remaining at P2, the economy will move to from point B to point C and the inflationary gap GDP will disappear. So let's, um, so I'll give you 10 minutes to uh, like get something to eat, coffee, et cetera. Just um, stretch your legs and uh, we'll see you back in 10 minutes. So see you back in 10 minutes.
Yeah, so discretionary fiscal policy as reflected by the downward shift of the tax line has, so let's kind of skip this here. So recently, recent Canadian fiscal policy, it was neutral to mildly expansionary in the early 1990s. So yeah, during the early 1990s, they were uh, early 1990s, Canada increased government spending and reduced taxes. Um, and then late 1990s, Canada increased taxes and reduced government spending to pay down debt. And then between 1995 and 2007, they were reduced, they were getting budget surpluses to pay down debt. And then since 2008, the Canadian government has been in deficit almost every year where they spend more than they tax. to grow the economy out of recession. So as you can see here, this is a good chart. Uh, so uh, they um, they were in a budget surplus from 2003 to 2008. So here, this is a surplus, surplus. Uh, taxes greater than government spending. And then here, deficit. So it's been mostly deficit. So deficit, government spending greater than taxes. So as you can see here, deficit happens here, 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 and then surplus happens here. And then this one year in 2015, it's a balanced budget. So taxes equals government spending. Yeah. So that's what happened here. This is what's happened in Canada. And uh, yeah, this is, this is what's happened over the last few years in Canada. So during COVID-19, the um, the deficits, almost every country was in deficit. They were spending more on, than taxes, than they were getting in taxes. And the deficits were so much bigger than they should be. So as you can see here, um, Canada, the cyclical budget deficit was neg negative 17.8%. Norway, negative 17.6%. United Kingdom negative thirteen percent all across the board. It was very, very, very high. So they were taking, they were spending a lot more than they were. Uh, they were spending. So these nations were spending more than they took in in taxes because of the uh, pandemic. Yeah. So this uh, there was a lot of need for spending during this period. And problems, criticisms, and complications of implementing fiscal policy. Uh, there's a there's usually a lot of lag to fiscal policy. It doesn't so like the government can spend money now, but the but the effect takes long to uh, take place. So like you need to wait a while until the effect takes place until the fact happens so yeah and also fiscal policy can lead to higher interest rates which is bad for the economy so um higher higher government spending can lead to higher interest rates which will reduce investment and this may lead to gdp staying the same as before.
So also there can be issues from abroad. So maybe so in the 2008 recession, the U.S. had a housing recession where the housing prices crashed and that affected Canada. So Canada's um, economy went into recession also. So there's all if, if the U.S. economy goes into recession, the Canadian economy will probably go into recession because they trade constantly with each other. Uh, a lot of it has to do with trade. So if the U.S. economy goes into recession, the Canadian will probably also because they're, they're the largest trading partners. So an expansionary fiscal policy aimed at increasing aggregate demand from 80 naught to 81 may hike the domestic interest rate and reduce net exports. The, the, decline, the decline in net export will partially offset the expansionary fiscal policy. The aggregate demand curve will shift rightward from 80 naught to 81, naught to 81, and the rise of equilibrium GDP will be more muted. So, so let's skip this here. So they use expansionary fiscal policy when there's recession or slow growth. The expansionary fiscal policy could lead to higher domestic interest rate. That leads to an increased dem foreign demand for dollars. The dollar appreciates, and this leads to net exports going down. So contractionary fiscal policy is used during inflation. It leads to a lower domestic interest rate, leads to decreased foreign demand for dollars. Dollar depreciates, net exports increase. So this is a very important chart. I'll put this in the chat. This this chart is very important. Um, yeah, so it shows uh, the butterfly effect to uh, fiscal policy. So this is called, so I call this, yeah, the butterfly effect fiscal policy. So yeah, like um, expansionary fiscal policy is used to uh, get the economy out of recession. This leads to a higher domestic interest rate. So foreign investors want to buy Canadian dollars. The Canadian dollar appreciates, goes up in value, and this leads to less net exports because now net now net exports are more expensive due to the higher value of the dollar, the Canadian dollar. So that's what would happen here. And then also a uh, contractionary fiscal policy is used during high inflation. This leads to a lower Canadian interest rate, then less investment in Canada from foreign investors. Canadian dollar depreciates, goes down in value, and this leads to more net exports for Canada because Canadian goods are more cheaper due to the lower dollar value. Yeah. The surplus is that annual amount by which government revenues exceed government expenditures. Budget deficit is annual amount by which government expenditures exceed taxes. And then public debt is accumulation of all past deficits and surpluses. So ownership. So the total public debt represents the total amount of money owed to the federal government, to the holders of Canadian government securities, financial instruments issued by the federal government to borrow money to finance expenditures that exceed tax revenues. Canadian government securities loan instruments are of four types, treasury bills, short-term securities, treasury notes, medium-term securities, treasury bonds, long-term securities, Canadian savings bonds, long-term non-marketable bonds. So all of those are, um, these 
four. So like um, treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds, and Canada savings bonds are how the government borrows to pay off their deficits. So they need to borrow because they are spending more money than they take in through taxes. And about 58% of the uh, federal government debt is held by the public and chartered banks. Bank of Canada holds 13% of the federal debt, while 29% of it is foreign owned. So how that works is... Um, how that works is 58 uh so um uh 58% of uh the loans to the government of Canada are by us as citizens and as and by banks so like uh RBC TD BMO CIBC uh, Scotia Bank CIBC and et cetera. And then 29% um, of loans to the government of Canada are by foreign investors. Um, and then 13% of loans to the government of Canada are by the Bank of Canada. So like the Bank of Canada prints money and the government of Canada borrows that printed money. So that's that's how um, that works there. So yeah, that, that's that's how the debt works in Canada. So what they can do, so what, what the government does a lot is um, they're doing this more and more as time goes on is um, the government is doing is uh, borrowing from the Bank of Canada more and more as time goes on because it is pretty easy to do since the Bank of Canada can print limitless money. Um, right? So the the government of Canada, uh, borrows that printed money. Uh, and there is no limit. While borrowing from Canada, Canada's banks and, uh, and Canadian investors and foreign investors, there is a limit to borrowing from Canadian banks and Canadian and foreign investors. Yeah. So the net debt is a percentage of GDP. The federal the net federal public debt is a percentage of GDP fell from the mid 1990s until 2008 and remained steady after that until the COVID-19 induced recession. So publicly held debt in international comparisons Canada has one of the lowest net federal public debts as a percentage of GDP among the G7 nations. In 2017, Japan had a public debt equal to nearly 240% of its annual GDP, while the Canadian public debt had amounted to only about just under 80% of GDP. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, public debts rose substantially in most countries around the world. So they took in more public debt to pay off uh, to grow the economy. So um, the problem with uh, debt is it hurts future generations because the future generations have to pay it off. So that's, that's a big problem. So we're letting the future generations pay it off basically. And then provincial per capita net debt varies widely among provinces. Significance variance exists among Canadian provinces. The federal government has a per capita debt of about $27,912. So that's per person. So it's debt divided by per person in Canada. 
equals per capita debt. It's like uh like uh Canada debt about a bit per person in Canada. So actually, so I'll rephrase it. So per capita debt equals Canadian debt divided by Canadian population. So 27, so each person in Canada, um, like on average, their debt is about 27,912 with federal government debt. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, federal government uh, debt divided by Canadian population equals per capita debt, government debt. So, uh, yeah, so we so twenty seven thousand nine hundred twelve dollars per person based on federal government debt, and the COVID nineteen recession in twenty twenty greatly increased this number as it did for the provinces. Newfoundland highest provincial per capita net debt, not far behind our Ontario and Quebec. Provinces with the least per capita debt are to be found in Western Canada. So Canada is twenty eight thousand three hundred ninety one dollars. Ontario is less at twenty seven thousand one hundred twelve. Saskatchewan's at about twelve thousand three hundred twelve. British Columbia is eleven thousand six hundred forty eight. So we want to have the lower, the better, for per capita debt. The lower, the better for total debt. Yeah. So we went through a lot today.